All right. Well, thank you all for uh, being here today. Uh, we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some updates for treatment of uh, structural heart disease. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be talking about things like transcatheter aortic valve replacement, transcatheter mitral valve repair. We'll be talking about uh, left atrial appendage occlusion using the Watchman device, and then ASD and PFO repair as well as uh, uh, debulking of tricuspid vegetations. And going through these, I think it's important for us to talk about the uh, role that we have in, in caring for these patients before and after. And I think seeing the actual procedure in animation helps to set the context for that a little bit better. So we'll start with our transcatheter aortic valve replacement program. And what you see in the videos that are being displayed is that we have two commercially available valves right now. The first available valve is the valve that will be displayed in the upper left-hand video, which is the Edward Sapien valve, which is a balloon expandable valve that we use to treat severe aortic stenosis. The second valve that we use is the Edwards, I'm sorry, the Medtronic uh, core valve, which is now the Evolute valve, and this is our self-expanding valve. Both valves are typically deployed from a transfemoral approach. Both valves require going over a stiff guide wire, but the major difference between the two is that we do rapid ventricular pacing for the balloon expandable valves, and we don't typically do rapid ventricular pacing when we put in the self-expanding valves. You can see in the lower right-hand screen that the self-expanding valve is simply that. It is sheathed inside of a delivery system, and then once it is unsheathed, it actually takes its natural state because the cage is made of nitinol, which is a nickel-titanium alloy, and is a memory metal, so it goes back to its original conformation. In the video that's playing in the upper left, looking at the uh, Edwards uh, uh, Sapien system, you can see that the, the valve is mounted onto a balloon system, and then you can see that we rapidly uh, pace the ventricle we then deploy the valve by inflating the balloon and then release the balloon and the valve is now in position. And so these patients are patients who have uh, the valve left in position afterwards with the native valve actually helping to anchor the new valve into position. And so because there is an implant, these patients will typically get antibiotics beforehand. And then based on current guidelines for treatment of post-valvular patients after they have had their either surgical valve or transcatheter valve, the re guideline recommendations are for anticoagulation. And here at Erlanger, we have deployed a strategy of treating all these patients with oral anticoagulation after their procedures. And so typically from patients who have had a percutaneous transfemoral approach, which is the vast majority of our patients, we will be starting their anticoagulation that night after the procedure. So if they've had their procedure on the Tuesday morning, then that Tuesday evening would be their time for their first dose of anticoagulation. These patients then uh, are usually relegated to about six hours of bed rest afterwards, anywhere from four to six hours, depending on their access sites and the size of the sheaths that we use. But then after that six-hour period, it's very important for these patients to be ambulatory very early. And so we're asking that not only do our nursing staff help to get these patients up and ambulatory as soon as possible, but we're also asking our physical therapists, our occupational therapists, and our cardiac rehab personnel to really help us ambulate these patients early and, and see if we can't do some initial assessments to figure out if these patients are going to need to be, uh, uh, be able to go home or if they're going to need uh, some sort of a rehab stay prior to discharge to home, and then to get them established importantly with cardiac rehab as cardiac rehab is a very important part to the overall uh, recovery of these patients after their transcatheter valve replacement. What you can see in the next slide here is an actual procedure that I did uh, very early on in our early experience with TAVR back in about 2012, 2013. And this was our original Sapien system. And you can see that uh, the system, uh, the, uh, the screen in the upper left-hand corner, were rapidly ventricularly paced at about 180 beats per minute. You can see that the X-ray dye is injected into the system, and then you can see the valve is deployed. And then in the lower right-hand screen, you can see that this is a valve that was deployed afterwards and what the final result actually looks like once that's all completed. 
So our transcatheter aortic valves uh, are typically done uh, now under conscious sedation. Uh, they are typically evaluated with transthoracic echocardiography at the time of their procedure. They will all the next morning receive a transthoracic echocardiogram to make sure that there has been no interval change since the deployment of the valve. And then again, these patients require early ambulation afterwards. The average age of our patients is in their 80s. Uh, these patients are typically older and sicker. Uh, and again, the, the evidence is overwhelming that early ambulation for these patients is very beneficial. Some patients will not be able to ambulate early, however, um, because there will be a, a small percentage of patients that will require ongoing evaluation probably in our CCU uh, because of the possible need for a pacemaker. Pacemaker implantation rates, in our experience at this institution, are less than 10 percent, but certainly something that we watch, and so cardiac monitoring after the procedure is still critically important. Next procedure that we're going to talk about is the mitral clip. So this is a transcatheter mitral valve repair system, and these patients have severe mitral regurgitation where a surgical approach is relatively uh, discouraged because of the uh, severe illness of the patients. And what you can see in the video screen here is that here is a patient with severe mitral regurgitation who is going for a mitral clip uh, procedure. Uh, so this is colloquially known as mitral clip procedure, but it's transcatheter mitral valve repair. This is done via a transeptal puncture. The transeptal puncture goes from the right atrium to the left atrium, and then we bring a large sheath up into the left atrium, which then allows us to then bring our delivery system with the clip in position to the, to the mitral valve. What happens at this point then is that we can then position the clip and we can move it in all directions. So anterior, posterior, superior, uh, lateral, medial, uh, all these types of positions, plus we can rotate the mitral clip itself in a number of different directions so that we can line it up with the area of the mitral valve that is the worst in terms of its area of regurgitation. And so what you can see here from this video is this is largely a imaging guided procedure with echocardiography. This is very little of this is actually done with fluoroscopy, but we do then bring the, the clip down into the ventricle below the level of the valve and we initially see if we like our position with the, with the clip in position there. And if we don't like it, we can reposition the clip and we can get to a better position by moving the clip one direction or another and then grasping it and seeing if we can uh, dramatically reduce the amount of mitral regurgitation. The follow-up then is a mitral valve opening that looks uh, like a double orifice with uh, the central or some part of the valve being uh, ad adherent to uh, the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet together. So you can see then once the clip is released that this then holds those areas together, significantly reducing the mitral regurgitation for these patients. And what these patients are typically coming in with are symptoms of severe heart failure, usually refractory to medical therapy, uh, usually recurrent hospitalizations. And with the deployment of a clip, we can significantly reduce their mitral regurgitation, improving their symptoms and decreasing the chances that they then come back for rehospitalization. So during a typical procedure, we do the vast majority of our imaging using transesophageal echocardiogram. So this was one of my first patients back in about 2015. And you can see that these uh, patients had severe mitral regurgitation with the mitral valve being the valve that's in the center of the screen. So the, uh, the top left shows the, the blood leaking back from the left ventricle down into the left atrium. And on the upper right screen, the, the image is uh, the opposite. The left atrium is at the top and the left ventricle is down below. And you can see that the regurgitation, that colorful jet flying back up towards the top of the screen is abnormal. We do a lot of 3D echocardiography to kind of help guide us in the positioning and see exactly where the problem is of the valve. And then what you can see is the vast majority of the imaging takes place with the positioning of the clip and such with the actual transesophageal echocardiogram. So we can bring the clip in, we can see it under echocardiography, we can see where the worst spot of the valve is, and then we can position our clip into that area. So what you can see here in the upper left-hand screen is that the clip is being placed below the level of the mitral valve. 
We're using color imaging to help us define where the worst part of the valve is in terms of its leak. You can see in the upper right hand screen we've now brought the grippers down from the clip to grasp both the anterior and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And you can see now in the bottom left screen that we are trying to evaluate our final positioning, make sure we like it, and then we release in the bottom right hand screen once we are satisfied with our final position. And this is what it looks like under fluoroscopy. Again, this is very little of this is done under fluoroscopy, but you can see that we have initially the uh, valve deployment, or the, I'm sorry, the clip deployment uh, uh, um, done under echo, and then we confirm it with our fluoroscopic imaging and you can see what this looks like in each setting. You can then see that following the deployment of the clip, what you're hoping to do is to have a significant reduction in the mitral regurgitation. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that this has significantly improved. You can see that double orifice opening that I described from the video in our upper right-hand screen on echo. And then follow-up transthoracic echocardiograms, the mitral valve will look as it does in the lower left-hand screen. And you'll see in the lower right-hand screen that there's very little mitral regurgitation that remains. These patients then will typically, again, because of an implantable, the patients will typically have an antibiotic beforehand. They will typically be on dual antiplatelet therapy, so usually aspirin and Plavix. If they are on uh, oral anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation, then again, these patients, because this is a percutaneous access, we would start their anticoagulation that night uh, and, uh, and, and go from there. Usually we're giving some antibiotics post-procedure as well. Um, if it's vancomycin, it's usually the next day, and if it's uh, 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 ANSEF, then it's usually for two uh, additional doses um, later in the evening after the mitroclip has been placed. Again, the same rule holds for the mitroclip patients as the TAVR patients. We typically have about four to six hours of bed rest, and we usually will put a stitch in to help uh, uh, achieve uh, venous hemostasis. So this is actually different from the TAVR in that we're not going into the femoral artery, but we're going into the femoral vein. And so with these mitroclip patients, they will usually have some sort of a stitch uh, placed over their skin site, which then compresses the vein itself, and that stitch can usually be taken out about two hours afterwards. And then that stitch has a uh, two ends of the stitch, uh, sort of you can think of the north end and the south end, and then there's a piece of the stitch that goes right in the middle, and the stitch can simply be removed by removing the clamp and pulling out from the center of the stitch and simply pulling the ends of the stitch through. So these patients will typically be on bed rest for that four to six hour period, two hours of which will be with the stitch in, and then the stitch gets taken out. And then again, just like the TAVR patients, we want early ambulation in these patients, working with our nursing staff, working with our physical and occupational therapists, and getting them into cardiac rehab and established early there. Our next uh, procedure to talk about are the... Uh, left atrial appendage occlusion patients. These are patients who typically have atrial fibrillation and require anticoagulation because of their increased risk of stroke, but for whatever reason cannot take anticoagulation. And so what we've found is that the left atrial appendage is where 90 plus percent of all thrombi are formed in AFib patients. And so if we can occlude the left atrial appendage, then we may be able to take these patients off their anticoagulation safely, protecting them against stroke and decreasing their chances of having a bleeding complication from having been on anticoagulation. What you can see here is the Watchman device, which is the only FDA-approved device on the market right now. The Watchman device is deployed in that left atrial appendage to then seal off the appendage, and then once we're happy with the position, then we can take these patients eventually off of their anticoagulation. Now, different than our other procedures, different than our TAVRs and our mitroclips, these patients are actually on anticoagulation at the time of their procedure. So they will come in on their warfarin or they will come in on their, on their um, Eliquis or uh, Pradaxa or Xarelto. And that's actually what we want for these procedures. Uh, we actually want their INR to be therapeutic. We actually will then do the procedure with them fully anticoagulated, and then we give additional anticoagulation during our procedure. We do a transeptal puncture, so we go from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart via a transeptal puncture as seen here. And then what we do is, again, this is coming from the femoral vein. So once the procedure is done, once we're happy with the deployment of the device, we then take the catheter and the sheath out, and we'll put another stitch over the vein itself. 
Again, because this is a vein, the stitch should usually be relatively sufficient. And again, we'll be in for about two hours after the procedure. The stitch can then be taken out after two hours. And if additional pressure needs to be held, it's just light pressure using the pressure that you would hold over a usual venous line uh, and uh, can usually be held for about 10 to 15 minutes and then usually is not a problem thereafter. Again, the venous stitch that we usually use, the skin stitch, is uh, the same for this as it is with our MitraClip patients. And the, uh, the skin stitch uh, can be removed very easily by removing the clamp, taking it off, and then pulling the stitch out from the middle. You can then see that what happens here is that this device endothelializes, so a layer of tissue forms over the device itself. These patients will stay on their anticoagulation for 45 days, and then they come back to our short stay unit where they'll get a repeat TEE. And once that TEE is completed, if we like the look of the device, we don't say any leak around the device, then these patients in turn will have uh, the opportunity to come off of their anticoagulation, which is the goal that we set forth for these patients. So you can see in these case examples here that, again, this is a, a procedure that's very highly dependent upon good echo imaging. So we do uh, perform these under general anesthesia so that we can do this with TEE. And then what we do is we give, uh, because it's an implantable device, we give antibiotics beforehand. We then have the patient come back to the hybrid uh, theater and we will then uh, perform this using both echo guidance and fluoro fluoroscopy. And you can see here in the right hand screen, you can see what the left atrial appendage looks like under echo. And you can see in the, up, in the right hand side of the screen, what it looks like when we inject contrast into that left atrial appendage. You can then see in the left-hand screen under fluoroscopy, you can see what the actual deployment of the device actually looks like when we do it under fluoroscopy. And you can see that the final result then is thoroughly evaluated by transesophageal echocardiogram. So our echocardiographers, particularly our CV anesthesiologists performing our transesophageal echoes, are very integral in the procedure itself in terms of helping us to determine whether or not our implant was successful, was the positioning appropriate, do we have any leak around the device, and so on. You can see in these pictures then on the left-hand side of the screen, we do a, a final contrast injection of the appendage uh, device to make sure that we like the final position. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that we've released the device from the delivery system, and we're simply doing a final evaluation to make sure we don't see any residual leak around the device itself. Again, these patients are going to be no different uh, following their procedure as are the MitraClip patients. So again, it'll be that bed rest and then early ambulation. There'll be an echocardiogram following these patients in the morning. And then uh, we will also uniquely bring these patients back to the cath lab the next morning to just do a quick fluoroscopic assessment to make sure that everything looks fine with the position of the device. And then they'll go home typically that very next morning. So these patients are usually in the hospital for one day. Our MitraClip patients are usually in the hospital for a day or two. And our TAVR patients are usually in the hospital for one or two days after their procedure as well. Another procedure that we do a lot of here at Erlanger are PFO and ASD closures. So you can see uh, in the left hand or in the in the echo uh, image that I'm showing on the center of the screen, you can see a bubble study that shows uh, a lot of uh, bubbles crossing over from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. And what you can see is that this is in a young patient who had a stroke for a reason we weren't able to identify, also known as a cryptogenic stroke. And so in this particular case, what happens is the patient then is set up for a PFO closure. So a PFO closure is a procedure wherein we can go and place a device. St. Jude has one of the FDA-approved devices. Gore has the other one. But we can cross through the fossa ovalis, and then we can deploy a nitinol disc on the left side of the interatrial septum, and then you can see we deploy another disc on the right side of the interatrial septum, and then we can release the device, and that then seals up the hole. What happens is, just like with the Watchman device for left atrial appendage occlusion, in the days and weeks thereafter, the device will endothelialize and completely seal off that hole. This is typically a procedure that, unlike all the other procedures that we have shown, uh, is typically done with conscious sedation. Uh, is not done with transesophageal echocardiography, but instead is done with intracardiac echo. So what we do is we'll put up two catheters, both from the right femoral vein. And so you can see in these pictures here, here's a patient who has a, 
a large PFO with an aneurysmal atrial septum. And you can see here that we're imaging with intracardiac echocardiography. You can see the color imaging on the upper left-hand screen. The upper right-hand screen shows a markedly positive bubble study with the patient performing a Valsalva maneuver. And then you can see as we're getting to release the device in the lower left-hand screen, what, that, uh, what those two discs look like before we release them. I oftentimes refer to those as two Frisbees on a stick. And then you can see in the upper, or I'm sorry, the lower right-hand screen, the final result of having released the device. And you can see all the bubbles on the right atrium, which is the top part of the screen, not crossing over into the bottom part of the screen, which is the left atrium, which is a much better result than what you see uh, at baseline in the upper right-hand screen. These patients, again, just like our other implantable patients, they will have uh, antibiotics before the procedure. They will typically either be on dual antiplatelet therapy before the procedure or will get loaded on Plavix after the procedure and are typically on Plavix for a month thereafter in addition to aspirin. These patients then will be like our other patients. They will have about four to six hours of bed rest. They will have the typical venous stitch in to just uh, apply additional pressure over the venotomy. These patients are typically reversed in the cath lab for their anticoagulation, and so the stitch can be taken out at two hours. These patients can get up and start walking around at about four hours, and then if they're looking good and feeling good, they, most of them will go home at about six hours after their procedure. The same holds true with our ASD patients. So you can see here, this is a patient, a young patient who was sent to me uh, after her pregnancy where it was diagnosed that she had a large atrial septal defect. You can see in the upper left-hand screen that there's an absence of tissue sort of in the 11 o'clock position connecting the two white pieces there. You can see all the color imaging on the upper right-hand screen showing that the flow from the left atrium or from the right atrium is going in towards the left atrium, vice versa. And you can see that there's significantly deficient tissue there in the three in the three-dimensional depiction in the lower uh, screen. You can see then that this is a device that was deployed for this young lady uh, with successful closure of the ASD. Again, this is primarily done under echo guidance, and again, this is done under conscious sedation. So the patients are awake and talking to us during the procedure, and then we deploy the device, and then they come back to their room and go home later that day. <clears throat> again, ASD patients are no different uh, with regard to their bed rest or antibiotic needs before or after. They'll also be on dual antiplatelet therapy for a month and then aspirin therapy as monotherapy thereafter. Uh, four hours of bed rest is the norm, uh, and then they're usually going home at about six hours as long as they have hemostasis at their uh, venotomy sites. Other procedures that we do, uh, we, we live in an area where there's a lot of endocarditis, uh, and so this is an image of somebody with a large vegetation on their tricuspid valve. Now, a little bit different than what we would see with some of these other catheters that we're using, I typically will place a 26 French sheath in the neck, and I will place usually a 19 French sheath in the groin, sometimes place another uh, 26 French sheath in the in the groin as well. So these are very large bore catheters, but again, will primarily just be treated with the, the skin stitch that uh, we've been talking about. Uh, those patients, however, because these are much larger systems, these patients will typically be on bed rest for the duration of the evening after their procedure, and then we'll take the stitches out the next day and let them ambulate thereafter. So you can see what we're doing here in the, in the left-hand side of the screen, we come in with a device called the Angiovac system. And this Angiovac will then come in and under transesophageal echocardiographic guidance, direct us to the tricuspid valve where we can then take the device and we can remove the vegetation. So you can see under fluoroscopic imaging on the right-hand side of the screen what that looks like. You can see that the uh, Angiovac cannula comes down into the heart and up to the tricuspid valve to allow us to remove these vegetations. And you can see the follow-up from these patients is remarkable in the sense that we get rid of most of the vegetation, not all of it, but these patients usually have a nice recovery thereafter and they didn't have to have their chest cut open to get this infection out of their heart. We do occasionally see it in weird places. This is an example of a pulmonic valve endocarditis, uh, and we were able to uh, retrieve this by going from the groin with our catheters and getting that, uh, that vegetation off of the pulmonic valve. Uh, you can see this is a very large catheter. 
Uh, so these, these sheaths are very, very large. So with regard to uh, some of the major uh, procedures that we do on a very regular basis, uh, these are, are sort of our usual protocols that we try to follow for these patients. Obviously, we do a lot of other very unusual procedures as part of the structural heart program, whether it's hokum ablation, whether it is uh, uh, closure of pulmonary AVMs, which we just did the other week, whether it is uh, paravalvular leak closures or VSD closures or those kinds of things, a lot of these patients will come through and there will be a lot of questions about what the usual protocol is. Uh, uh, myself, uh, my structural colleagues, uh, Autumn Bartonfield and, and Gigi Sims, are, wel are, are, are welcoming to questions uh, and certainly willing to help do education along the way. So we ask people to please ask us the questions so that we can help answer them. Uh, anticoagulation tends to be a big issue. And so the anticoagulation piece is for patients who are on watchmen. We want them to be on anticoagulation before the procedure, during the procedure, after the procedure. And then for our TAVR patients, um, because of the concerns of subclinical valve leaflet thrombosis, we have adopted a policy here of anticoagulating our patients with typically with warfarin if they don't have atrial fibrillation, but if they do have atrial fibrillation and are on one of the uh, new oral anticoagulants such as Eliquis, Xarelto, or Pradaxa, then those patients will typically go back onto those medications and can go back as soon as that night after the procedure. What we tend to do for mitroclips is usually dual antiplatelet therapy. For our ASD and PFO devices is dual antiplatelet therapy. And then we tend not to do any anticoagulation for our endocarditis patients. The venous stitch, as you've been hearing about, is a, is a frequently used mechanism to help us uh, achieve hemostasis in a lot of our, especially femoral veins. Sometimes we'll put it up in the jugular vein after we put a 26 French sheath in the neck. But these uh, stitches are, are very simple. Uh, and, and shouldn't cause a lot of consternation. Uh, the stitch goes in through the skin in two different sites, one below and one above. So there's one end of the stitch that comes out below, there's one end of the stitch that comes out above, and then there's a little bit of stitch in the middle. There is a little plastic clamp, or I'm sorry, a little plastic tube that holds the stitch in place with a uh, throwaway uh, hemostat. The hemostat can be taken off, the plastic tubing can be removed, and simple uh, pulling of the stitch from the middle of the stitch, where both ends then pull through the skin and out, is, is, the, uh, is the standard process for this. These are uh, very um, uh, meant to be very uh, simplistic stitches so that uh, they don't cause a lot of uh, uh, problem or confusion in the middle of the night, but again, we're always happy to help with uh, managing that. The uh, ideas that I want to make sure that everybody is aware of when it comes to the structural heart program is that not only is this structural heart program uh, about uh, the providers performing the procedures, but it is more so about the nursing staff and, uh, more importantly, uh, the, 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 the staff that are taking care of the patients from anywhere from our echocardiographers to our uh, uh, staff in the cath lab and the hybrid lab to our uh, PT and OT colleagues. The nurses taking care of these patients before and after are critical importance. And, uh, and so I think it, it is really meant to uh, hopefully come across as this is uh, a team effort for these patients all the way through from beginning to end. And the, and, and the, the nursing uh, importance here shouldn't be underplayed at all. Again, I want to just make sure that people are aware of who our team members are. Gigi Sims is our valve coordinator who uh, is a wealth of knowledge and a resource not only for our patients but uh, for our staff as well. Autumn uh, Bartonfield, formerly Redmond, Autumn Bartonfield, I'll, I'll update that one of these days, uh, is, uh, is uh, the nurse practitioner on our team who uh, sees a lot of these patients in the before and after setting and, and is very valuable in terms of her knowledge and, and management of these patients uh, before, during, and after. Um, Dr. Guerra is one of the cardiologists, one of the interventionalists who does perform TAVR with me for his patients coming out of Dalton, Georgia. Otherwise, I do these uh, procedures most, oftenly with my, most often with my surgeon partner, Dr. Shears. Uh, Dr. Manium and I do the, uh, um, do the watchman procedures together. Uh, Dr. Jahania will be joining us soon. And then our imaging specialists 
are all of our CV anesthesiologists, including Dr. Barker, Shemin, Kennedy, and Richardson, and then our cardiac imaging people, who you will see on the short stay unit doing our pre-procedure or post-procedure TEEs, are Drs. Bailey, Patel, Mikolai Stevens, and, and Dr. Groover as well. She's, uh, I, I forgot to put her on the list as well, but these are people who are all part of this team. And again, most importantly, the staff on the short stay unit and uh, on the step down unit, as well as CCU and CVICU who are also caring for these patients. And with that, I thank you very much.